Hello and welcome to the second workshop in the NYSALA Professional Development Series for 2021. This is a recording from the Embedding Authentic Resources into Lesson Plans workshop delivered by Leslie Gran on January 20th, 2021. My name is Candace Black and as the World Languages Associate from the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages at the New York State Education Department, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this professional learning opportunity. I would like to thank Elisa Alvarez, the Associate Commissioner of our office, as well as the New York State Association of World Language Administrators for sponsoring this workshop. The NYSALA Board of Directors is headed up by President Francesco Fratto from the Herricks Public School District. Other members of the board include Vincenza Graham, Jennifer Nesfield, Denise Hanoi, Lori Marshall Loria, and Tara Tassani. The planning committee for this workshop, as well as for the professional learning series, consists of the NYSALA Board of Directors and the following individuals. Joan Anderson, Laura Arpi, Andrea Diaz, Julie Kreischman, Gian Liu, Dr. Elaine Margarita, Louisa Mota, Dr. Joanna O'Toole, Greg Smith, and Eris Thompson. The workshop's agenda includes a brief introduction and review of what authentic resources are and how to select them, a discussion of both the introductory and guided phase of the lesson with some built-in exploration time, and a transition to the independent phase of the lesson with some important tools that teachers can use to embed authentic resources into lessons. Participants can stop the tape at any time to take breaks as necessary. In order to earn CTLE credit for this event, participants must watch the entire video and answer at least seven out of 10 questions correctly on a post assessment. Participants who do not earn the required score on the first attempt may take alternative versions of the post assessment in order to achieve the required score. Participants will not be given any credit for taking the same post assessment more than once. The link for the first version of the post assessment is listed on the OBEWL professional learning website for this workshop. We are thrilled to invite back Leslie Graham, a noted leader, presenter, author, and blogger in the field of world language education to present this second workshop. Ms. Graham will explore how to make authentic text work for world language educators in the various phases of lesson planning. Participants will consider how to embed authentic resources into the phases of lesson plans, analyze scenarios for embedding these resources, and use a planning guide to build authentic resources into lesson plans. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our presenter, Leslie Gran. I'm so glad you're here to join me for this session on embedding authentic resources in lesson plans. And this is something that lots of teachers have asked me about. We know that ACTFL recommends that we use lots of authentic resources in our instruction, but the question is, how do I make them work? How do they fit into my normal lesson planning process? And so that's what our focus is going to be today. If you haven't met me before, I'm Leslie Gran. I am the, was the coordinator of world languages here in Howard County, Maryland which is between Baltimore and Washington, where I supervised about 200 world language teachers, pre-K 12, um, eight languages. Before that, I was in the classroom for 27 years, teaching middle school and high school French and Spanish. For the last four years, I've been retired and I spend lots of time curating and creating resources to help world language teachers through all of these shifts that we've gone through over the last months, and also doing lots of professional learning like this with teachers like you across the country. So if you wanna find me online, my website is grandforlang.com. That's grand as in my last name, for as in foreign, and lang as in language.com. You can also follow me on Twitter by that same moniker at Grand Four Lang. And you can find me on Pinterest by my name or by Grand Four Lang. So here are our outcomes for today. We're going to think about how to embed authentic resources in the different phases of our lesson plans. 
And we're gonna look at it through the lens of the gradual release of responsibility framework. Then we're gonna look at some scenarios for embedding authentic resources into lesson plans. So I'm gonna show you lots of examples. And then finally, we're gonna have a planning guide in the folder in Google Drive, the link I'll share with you in just a bit, um, to help you think through these processes. So here's what my website looks like. So grandforlang.com. And for today's work, you want to go to the pages um, called Authentic Resources, and supports and scaffolds, although I will share other pages on my website that contain resources that would relate to some of the topics we're gonna to talk about today. And then this is what my Pinterest boards look like. I think I'm up to something crazy like 200 boards and over 18,000 pins or something. Um, and so the idea there is I want you to know that you can go to my Pinterest boards and I've already collected and curated authentic resources for you either under general topics. So for example, it'll just say German memes and quotes or uh, infographics in Italian. And so those are mixed topics or themes or you can go to a specific theme. So for example, if you're teaching a unit on family, you can go to the board called family. And there I've just curated and collected lots of authentic resources, but for multiple languages. And so if you go through that board, you're looking for your language and the authentic resource types that would work for you in your lesson plans. So on this, slide, I encourage you to take a screenshot of it so you can grab that URL. And that URL is the link to the resources that I've put into the folder for you. And so on the far left are those scenarios I talked about earlier. In the second from the left is the planning guide. And then on the right, you see two things that are very graphic. One is what I call the game board. And the other one is called the formula. And so we'll, you, you'll understand more about what those are, but I want you to know you have access to all of these things during the, the webinar now and also afterward. So I'm a huge believer in checking in with each other for our social emotional well being. Not only should we be checking in with our students on a regular basis and finding out how they're feeling because this has been a very anxious and stress inducing time in our lives during the pandemic. And so it's so important that we're addressing that side, not only of our students' lives, but also of our own lives. So practicing self-care. So what I'm asking you to do today is to pick one task from this winter to-do list that I found and decide what you might do for yourself for self-care this week. It's important that we plan things to take care of ourselves on a regular basis so that we're not stuck on Zoom and on our computers all the time, but we're doing things that bring us joy. We're doing things that allow us to move and spend time with our family and friends, et cetera. If you're interested, every Monday and Thursday, I post a teacher well-being task. And I've been doing that since August. So I think I'm up to 50 something at this point. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see them. Also, I post them on my website. And it just gives you some suggestions of something you might do that week to really prioritize your self-care. Okay, so you might know that this is the second part of a two-part series we've been working on. So back in November on election day, we did a webinar called Curating Authentic Resources for the World Language Classroom. That was all about how do I find them? How do I decide which ones I wanna keep? How do I know, how do I select them? So I know that they're appropriate for my students and for their proficiency level. And also, where do I put all these things once I have them? So it was a lot of the mechanics of what is authentic text? Why should we use authentic text? How do I find them and curate them? How do I select them and where do I put them? So now part two, which is what we're doing today, is gonna to be about 
now that I have collected all of these authentic resources for a particular unit theme, how do I then take the next step and make them work for me in my lesson planning? So we know that ACTFL has recommended six core practices to us, and they're illustrated here on this slide. These came out several years back, and now some people refer to them differently. We say core practices, some people say guiding principles. So if you go on the ACTFL website and search guiding principles, these will pop up. We're also referring to these as high leverage teaching practices. You know, most of the other subject areas like math, science, social studies, and language arts have these core practices that they believe all teachers of that content area should practice because we know through practice and research that they are highly effective in our case in moving students along the proficiency continuum. So obviously today we are focusing in on the second core practice which is guiding learners through interpreting authentic resources. But as we talk today you're gonna to see that some of the other ones also come into play because they live together, right? And so you will see some overlap with some of the other core practices. So this is a screenshot of one of the pages from the Necessful Actful Can Do Statements. And you are not supposed to be able to read that little print. So don't try to squint to see it right now. Um, the idea is that we want to stay anchored in the idea of what do the can-do statements tell me about what students can do with text in the interpretive mode at the various proficiency levels. And so this is a great guide to use, which gives me information about, I want to make sure that when I'm designing tasks for students to do with authentic resources, that it is at their current proficiency level or one level above. But what I don't want to do is ask them to do something with text that is way above their current proficiency level because that can be highly frustrating to students. Students will often disengage from tasks like that. So we want to stay anchored in the idea that if I'm teaching novices, I want to pay attention to what novices can do with text at their proficiency level. So here's a word cloud I created, and it just has a whole lot of different authentic text types on it. And so you see that there's all, all, lots and lots of them. I certainly haven't thought of every single one that exists on the planet, but what I'd like you to do is take a moment, take a look at some of these authentic resource types and think about one, which of these text types have your students found engaging? So have you used song lyrics with students before? Was that engaging with, to them? Have you used comic strips before? Have you used memes, et cetera? So first take a moment just to think about which of those text types have you used with your students that they really had a positive reaction to? So I'll pause and let you think about that for a second. Okay, for our next um, step, what I'd like you to do is think about authentic text types you see on this word cloud that you haven't used with your students yet, but you know they would find highly engaging. So an example might be things like Instagram posts and text messages. If that's something you haven't used before, we know that that will be engaging to our I generation because they're on social media all the time. And so I'm hoping that not only does this validate the types of authentic text you've already used with your students, but also gives you ideas about other types of text you might want to incorporate into your lessons. So when we talk about the why of authentic resources, we first think about the idea that authentic resources are real life examples. They're things that come from real, everyday, real world situations. Remember that authentic text is text that is created for and by target language users. They are not created for language learners. So it's very interesting 
to our iGeneration learners that they're looking at something that people from the target language country would actually interact with. This was not sanitized for a language learner and only contains the words they know, like a textbook activity might, but instead it's a real thing that people interact with. So that might be something like um, the food pyramid or a healthy eating plate, right? So the idea is that that's something that real people in their country would look at from their department of health, for example. And so that's interesting to kids. Also remember that authentic resources provide content to kids. We want them to see that it widens what they know about the particular topic or theme we're doing. And also it shows structure. Now, what we mean by that is by interacting with text, students are understanding syntax better. They understand how words go together. They're seeing the types of phrases you've been talking about in class being used by real people. Because they're authentic, authentic resources provide information about the culture because if they're authentic, they're, in cult they're culturally embedded in some way. And don't forget that authentic resources can provide students with input. Students should feel like they're walking away knowing more words than they did before they interacted with the text. So this is the selection card that I have that talks about how to select authentic text. And we actually talked about this the last time, but I just wanna remind you that it has the four A's on it. And so obviously it should be authentic. We talked about how it should be accessible to students. So that means that it should be at the right level of rigor, the right level for their age, for example. So if you're teaching elementary students, you would want that to be on their level as well. And if novices are interacting with it, we wanna make sure there's lots of visual support and cognates and things like that for them to help build their confidence that they can interpret the text. We want them to be appealing. We want kids to kind of sit up and go, whoa, what's that, right? That's a, that looks like an Instagram post. Is that a real person's Instagram post, right? So it should grab their attention. It should be novel. It should be humorous. Something that's gonna kind of grab their attention. And then finally, it should be aligned in some way. It should be aligned to my learning targets. It should be aligned to the theme or the structures that I've been talking about in class. It could be aligned to current events that students are interested in right now. There should be some connection there for students. And I wanna make sure that it makes sense why I'm showing it to my students. And then you might remember from the last time, one of the most important things we wanna think about when we're selecting authentic resources, even if somebody like me has already curated them for you and put them on a Pinterest board, where I'm looking at them to make sure there are not inappropriate things in that text, you still need to preview them. You need to make sure they're appropriate for this time in your teaching, for your student's age group, for the maturity level, et cetera. So it is still incumbent upon us as professionals to make sure that we're previewing everything we show our students. So now the big question mark is, how do I put these into my lesson plans? And that's our focus for today, right? So the first step we took was collecting all these things and curating them and putting them into folders or on our own Pinterest boards or in some kind of location like a Google Drive folder. And now we're gonna consider how they fit into my lesson plans. So when I think about building a unit around authentic resources, there's a few pieces of advice I have for you. So this is a picture of a group of teachers up in Long Island who are looking at a bunch of um, laminated authentic resources all on the same topic. And you'll notice they're kind of sorting them on the tabletop of which ones might be good for which purposes in my classroom. So a couple pieces of advice I have for you is, let the authentic resources lead the way. In other words, you take a look at them and figure out what are they telling you in terms of the way they might be best used in my, in my lesson plans and in my classes. 
Don't try to force them. So the idea is you don't want to think in your mind, I need something for an info gap activity. And I really like this one that I'm going to force it to turn into one. Really look for the natural connections that will happen. And we'll talk more about that as we go along today. And then as you're looking at these authentic resources, look for vocabulary, look for grammar, look for cultural themes, look for authentic texts that might be great to build skill. So building reading skills in students, building their skill in um, interpersonal communication. What are these different resources telling you in terms of the types of tasks they might be best for? And so here I have just a six different resources I might have in a collection. These are in Spanish on the topic of recycling. And you can see that you can imagine I might have 30 some of these, but here's six. And so I have things like um, infographics and a little cartoon and I've got a video and I've got a picture down the center. So I've got all of these authentic text types. Now that's important. When I'm collecting these authentic resources for a particular unit or theme, I wanna think about as many different types as possible. I don't want all of them to be an article. I don't want all of them just to be a song. I wanna mix up the text types so that my struggling learners, my reluctant learners, my advanced learners, there's something for everyone to be engaged with. So let's take a look at this model that's here on the screen. This is what's called the gradual release of responsibility model. And the concept is, is that for the most part, when we teach, we begin by doing input and giving kids new content in some way. And during that phase, that is very much teacher centered. Then we go to a guided phase where we do the, we use the content with the students, right? So we guide them along. And then finally, I'm trying to get them to the point where they feel confident to use the content by themselves, which is called the independent phase. So you can see across the top on the blue bar that I'm going from teacher-centered teaching to student-centered. And so that's why it's called gradual release because I'm slowly releasing the cognitive load to the students. Many of you may have heard of this model in terms of I do, input, we do, guided, and you do, that's in independent. And in fact, often between the guided, the yellow part, and the independent, which is the green block, a lot of people put a fourth step in there in between guided and independent called you do together. And so before I go from guiding them to having them do things by themselves, I have them try out the content with a partner or small group. And that provides that support and models from classmates for students who may not be as sure about their learning. Now across the bottom, you'll see that I've matched these various um, phases of the lesson to our in, uh, communicative modes. So in the input phase, mostly the majority of the time students are interpreting. So they're listening to what the teacher is presenting. Now, certainly there is some interaction, but I'm saying what is the overall um, arching communicative mode? In the guided mode or in the guided phase, there's a lot of interpretive still happening and then some presentational where students might respond to a question. And then in the in independent phase, there's where I get the interpersonal and presentational. And then notice across the bottom, all along the way, I'm collecting data. When are kids ready to move from one phase to the next and then to the next? That data I'm collecting from students on their learning informs me about when they're ready to be released to the next phase. Now in your folder, you'll see that I have a handout there for you, which I referred to earlier as a guide. And you'll see that this is also divided into those three sections, introductory activities, guided activities, and independent activities. 
So that's exactly how we'll go through the next several phases is we'll just look at the different segments of the gradual release model and look at the types of activities we would do during that phase. And then what kind of, what way, in what ways can we use authentic text during those phases? So if you like to, you can go to the Google Drive folder here. So if you wanna pause, oh, excuse me, pause the video and go to the Google Drive folder and pull this up on your screen, you can, although I will be showing um, screenshots of it as we go along. Okay, so let's start with the introductory phase. So during the introductory phase, I'm trying to get students' attention. So that typically is something like a, a lesson hook, a warm up, some kind of do now activity. I'm tapping in their prior knowledge. I'm connecting the new things they were learning to something they learned before. I'm giving new vocabulary. I might be leading them through a process to discover grammar and context. There's a variety of things I might do during this introductory phase. So let's start with gaining students' attention through things like lesson hooks. So lesson hooks are all about, you know, students attended some other class typically before they come to your class or they just arrived at school and you're the first period. So how do we get kids in the mode of thinking in the target language from the very beginning of class? So that's why it's called a hook. We want to hook their attention. And so we want to make sure that our hooks are aligned to our unit theme. We want to make sure that they might show structures and content. They're of interest to students. And look at the last two bullets there. I might use a lesson hooks to be the context for an interpersonal exchange. Or I might use them as a context for a free write where students open up their journals or open up their digital journals and they write in response to the lesson hook activity. So here's three examples of some memes. And the one in the center is a quote that I might use as a lesson hook. So things like this, authentic resources like the ones on the screen here are very friendly for lesson hooks from novices up because they tend to be low on text. And so I, I chose these for some sort of reason for a connection that it has for my students. And so in the far left, you see a meme in Italian that says, okay, it's Monday, remain calm. So am I using this during a time that I'm talking about the days of the week? So that would be like in level one. And it just has a funny thing about having to come back to school and work on Mondays. Or am I using it to reinforce or open up a discussion about command forms because it says remain calm, you remain calm. And so I might be showing that because I wanna talk about imperatives or command forms today in class. In the center is a saying or a quote that one happens to be in Chinese. And so how am I using that? Well, I might have students look at it, learn to walk before you run. Then they open up their journals and tell me what you think that's about. So if I have novices, they might be just listing words or short phrases that they think of when they see this. Whereas more in the intermediate level, I might have students write a whole paragraph or a journal entry about what does this mean? Give me an example from your real life about you how you had to learn to walk before you were able to run. So the idea of learning from the beginning and go slow and then be able to do whatever your goal is at the end. And then on the right is just a funny one with a cat. That one happens to be in Portuguese. And it says, um, this is my face when I have to go to school tomorrow, right? And so the idea is that where everybody's grumpy because we have to go back to school like on a Monday. And so just giving kids a little um, funny thing to start off the, the lesson. That might be something they turn to their partner about and say, oh yeah, when I wake up on Monday mornings, it's so hard, I have trouble getting up and just have a little interpersonal exchange. I can also use something like social media posts for a lesson hook. So the one on the top left happens to be in Italian and it's talking about what people did during uh, the pandemic to stay in shape at home because we were all at home in quarantine. Notice how it's highly visual. 
you can tell the person's dancing, the person's exercising, right? These kinds of things. And on the bottom right is a Instagram post about how to tell if something is fake news or not. And that's really important because we know there's a lot of disinformation out there, teaching students how to tell whether something is true or not. Again, very simple to interact with because lots of those verbs are not only cognates, but it also is nice and succinct. It's not a big long um, article they're trying to read as a lesson hook. And again, think about how they could use this as an exchange with another person, how they might post a, a discussion post about it, how they might write something about it in a free write. Just think about all the ways students could react to this as the beginning of your lesson. And then think about how I could just use pictures. Because remember, authentic uh, um, interpretive mode is anything I can listen to, view, or read. So view includes photos or pictures. Now these happen to be three examples of paintings by Fernando Botero from Colombia. And what I like about this is that it's giving choices. So I might show all three of these and have students choose one to describe in their journal or to describe to their friend or fill out a, um, some sort of organizer about what I see. So what people do I see? What are they wearing? Where do I think they are, et cetera. Choice is highly engaging to students. So I always encourage teachers to give choices when possible. It's not necessary that every student describes the exact same picture, as long as all of the choices all are aimed at the same learning targets. Now, what about teaching authentic text to introduce new vocabulary? So the old school kind of way that we used to um, introduce vocabulary is we would put a PowerPoint together and we would put pencil on a, um, on a slide by itself. So there'd be a picture of a pencil and then the word pencil and kids would repeat it. Then we would go to the next one, notebook, scissors, paper, pen, et cetera. The problem with that is that's not in context. There is no context for it. It's teaching words, what I call in the air. They're in isolation. How can I use authentic text to provide a context for learning vocabulary? So take a look at the example of the infographic here on the screen. It is a survey that was done in Mexico. Um, people who responded to the survey uh, um, responded about how they use their free time. So how they occupy themselves during their free time. Notice how this is very visual. It's obvious to students that that's a computer, that that's a television, that that's a book at the bottom. So if you were teaching free time activities or reinforcing it the following day after having um, introduced it the previous day, this is very friendly. Not only does it have high visual, lots of um, cognates, but it's real, real people responded to this survey. So that's the hook here, is that students are like, really, 62% said they're on their computer during their free time? Is that the same or different from what you would say, right? And so whole conversations around how people responded to this survey and how that might match how we feel about our free time. And so the reason we wanna to try to use things like this is because they're highly visual, they provide a context. So instead of learning computer and television and book all by themselves, they're within the context of this survey. And it just adds interest and a real world connection about what people in that country said when they took this survey and how would that be same or different if they had given the same survey here in the US. Here are some more examples of authentic resources you might use to teach vocabulary. The one on the far left is an infographic about careers. And you can see the career words and then also a picture of the career, um, the, what the career means. And notice how I could introduce careers with this and the infographic itself is about how well trusted, how much do people trust certain occupations? And so you see at the top, there's fire, um, 
firefighters, and then ambulance drivers, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera. Sadly, we're down there, the next to the last one with the ABC teachers, but with, that's still 82%, which is pretty good. But think about how much more engaging that is to find out which careers or occupations people trust the most than just learning it in isolation. The one in the center is an infographic in French. And it's about a soccer player, a famous world soccer player, professional um, soccer player, and all of the parts of his body that he's injured over the years. Again, think about how more interesting that is if I was going to teach parts of the body, how much more interesting that is versus having a little um, gingerbread man outline and then labeling it with the different parts of the body. This has a context. And then on the far right, you'll see an infographic in Spanish about how to pack for a trip. And notice on this infographic, it talks about how many of each type of clothing you should pack. So how many pairs of socks, how many pairs of underwear, how many shirts, how many pants, et cetera. What a great way to introduce um, the vocabulary of clothing by talking in the context of, I have to pack for a trip. What do you think I should pack? And so again, by putting it in some kind of context or scenario, higher probability that students will engage with it and remember it because it's part of a story in some way. So how might I use these when I'm introducing vocabulary? So if you're using an infographic, one idea is to have all of the words covered up by text boxes or in the physical classroom if you're on your document camera with little sticky notes. And then as you introduce each one, you remove those boxes or the cover-ups and reveal the word. The students might have a version that has all of the words missing and they fill them in as they're learning them. And again, this would be contextualized as opposed to writing the word and writing the English beside it. And then I suggest a third option where students have pieces of the infographic and slowly but surely they're putting it together as you introduce the various um, aspects of the infographic. So what I'm gonna ask you to do here is to pause the video and I'd like you to go onto my Pinterest boards. I would like you to go to either a topic that you teach. So let's say you teach foods. So go onto the Pinterest board for food and I'd like you to try to find some sort of authentic resource that you could either use to introduce vocabulary or to use it as a lesson hook for your unit. Another option would be to go onto my Pinterest boards and find the board called Authentic Text and then your language, French memes and quotes, Spanish memes and quotes, German memes and quotes, et cetera. There you will find lots of memes and you can look at those through the lens of which of these might make great lesson hooks for my students. So I'm asking you now to pause the video and go onto the boards and find some things you could use to introduce vocabulary or to use as a lesson hook. So I'll pause here. Okay, I hope you were able to find some great ideas for lesson hooks and introducing vocabulary using authentic resources during that pause. And the whole purpose of you doing that was for you to just get a feel for how you might go through that process. And you certainly can go back and do that once you've gathered all of your resources for a particular unit. So now we're gonna to go to the second part of the gradual release of responsibility model. And that's the guided phase, or some people call it, we do, where the teacher is guiding students through and involving kids in the content, but they're not quite ready to completely use the content on their own yet. So during this time, I might be teaching some interpretive skills like reading skills or, um, ways to get meaning from text because we want to teach kids different strategies for when they interact with text in the target language 
What strategies can I use to help me figure out what it's saying? I might do a think aloud with students. I might practice with them how to use scaffolds and supports. So I might practice with them how to fill out a graphic organizer, for example, before I ask them to do that on their own. So during this guided phase, the keyword is modeling. So I'm giving lots of models and examples to students. And what's important for that, by them seeing a model or hearing an example, it helps them further understand, especially if you're giving all the directions in the target language, it helps them understand the specific task you're asking them to do. So one thing I could be doing is practicing different kind of reading strategies with students. So I might put a authentic resource up and say, okay, let's practice looking at text features. So what do you think the title's telling us? What do you think the subtitle's telling us? What does this visual tell me about what this is going to be about? Might I do a guided activity around context clues? Let's figure out what this word means based on all the words around it. And again, we're doing these kind of think aloud things with students where they're gaining ideas for how when they're interacting with text by themselves, they can figure out what things mean. Looking for the main idea, reading for an author's purpose, making inferences or predictions, making a cultural comparison. How do I do an, a personal reaction to a text? These are all things that we need to initially model for students before we ask them to do it by themselves. And when I'm modeling, I wanna make sure I'm doing lots of connections with students, make sure I'm doing it in context and lean on the strategies that we know students have acquired through language arts. We know through language arts, students have learned a variety of reading strategies since they've been very little. We just wanna reinforce those in the target language. Think alouds are a great example of a modeling tool where as I look at a text, I'm thinking out loud and using I statements so that students see the kind of thinking strategies or you can see there it says metacognitive strategies that they might use when they're interacting with a text. So for example, if I put up a um, poem, then I would start talking through the poem with the students and say, okay, let me look for all the words I already know. Oh, I think I know this word, let's mark that word. What else, what other words do I know? And then get the students to help you out there. And so it gives them a process. So the next time they interact with text by themselves, they say to themselves, oh, I could do the thing where I mark it up and I say, words I know, words I can guess, words that look like words I know in English, for example. And then they, they start acquiring those same skills. So here's an example of a modeling activity I might do in a French class. So the infographic there is about camping and no, you shouldn't be able to read it, it's teeny tiny. But the idea is that the teachers notice that students are giving always very short sentences. And really they're at a level now that they should be able to give more compound and complex sentences in response. They should be able to do more. And so this particular infographic has what people do when they camp, who they camp with, where they camp, so all the, what they camp in. And so it just has those different colored sections have different aspects of camping. And so the teacher begins this modeling activity during the guided phase by, by having them create very simple sentences. Campers camp in tents. Where else does it say they camp? Campers camp in uh, RVs campers camp in cabins, right? And so they look for the information from the infographic. Now the next model is where do they camp? Campers camp in the Laurentide, which is mountains. Campers camp by the river. Campers camp in the desert or whatever the different examples are. And then who do they camp with? Campers camp with friends. Campers camp with their families. Campers camp alone. And then finally, what do they do when they go camping? They go hiking, they go bird watching, they, right? So all the different activities they do. And all of this is directly from the text. So now the teacher wants to model a more complex or com, uh, compound sentence. 
campers camp in tents in the Laurentide to go hiking with friends. So now we've given them a model to extend the sentences they're coming up with from the infographic. And now the students try to make some more examples of that complex sentence. So that was on purpose because as a teacher, I want the students to practice making larger, longer, more complex and detailed sentences instead of sticking with the short little three word sentences because they should be able to do that at their current level of proficiency. Now, remember I shared with you earlier that between the guided phase and the independent phase is a phase people call you do together. And that's where we leverage pair and small group work. So right before we go from the guided phase to independent phase and in between step is to let students work with a partner or in small groups because that supports them to move to the independent phase. And so I wanna provide models for the students. So by be working with a partner or a small group, I have a model from my friends because my classmates are given examples. It's a great transition before I go to um, independent phase. And the whole idea is that it's a great model for my reluctant and struggling learners. Now on this word cloud, you'll see lots of examples of cooperative learning strategies which have been around for years. They were developed originally by Spencer Kagan. I'll bet many of you know several of these strategies. You may not have known that they're Spencer Kagan's cooperative learning strategies, but I'll bet you know about Think Pair Share, Four Corners, um, Inside Outside Circles, Carousel Brainstorming, Jigsaw. Those are all strategies that he developed around the concept of cooperative learning. And the idea is that all students play a role and cooperate during this activity. So they are fantastic strategies. I still believe they're some of the strongest strategies, strategies on the planet because they're so well crafted. So let me show you an example. You know, Jigsaw is where students take, I take some sort of text and I divide it up into parts and then groups just do, interpret one part of the text, and then they get together with students that have the other parts of the text and share what they learned. And so as you're looking at the authentic resources you collected for a particular unit, look through the lens of which of these might make great jigsaw activities. So look at the two examples here on the screen. On the left here, there are descriptions of three young people. Imagine cutting that into thirds and having one group do the gentleman on the left, the young man on the left. One group is going to find out about the girl in the center and one is going to find out about the young man on the right. Take notes somehow on a graphic organizer or chart and now meet back and tell about their person and then look for similarities and differences between what they like, what they wear, et cetera. On the right there, you'll see in French, a, uh, an infographic about volunteering. And you'll see that it's divided into sections. Why do people volunteer? Where do people volunteer? How often do they volunteer? In my, when I'm looking at authentic resources, immediately I think, oh, that could be cut up into a jigsaw. So have one group explore the whys of people volunteering some, but a group do the where's and a group do the how often's, and then again, come together and share. Another example of a cooperative learning strategy is a strategy called placemat. And placemat is where there's some sort of prompt in the center of the mat. And then the students who are, imagine students sitting around a, um, a table together the section of the, the outer sections of the placement that are closest to the student are their section. So by my sitting here, I'm the bottom section below the infographic. The person on my left has the left-hand section. The person on my right has the right-hand section. The person across from me has that top section. And so we begin by just looking at the prompt, which this happens to be an infographic about should you get a dog or a cat? And I'm gonna just make lots of notes in my section of the placemat. And this is a quiet time where students are doing this either on a Google slide, if it's virtual, 
or they're doing this on a physical placemat. And then once students have had time to take their notes, then they have some sort of discussion or sharing about what they got from the um, authentic resource. Now, I know lots of teachers that I've been working with lately across the country are all struggling with the idea that they put students into breakout rooms and often they come in on the breakout rooms and they realize the students aren't really um, doing the tasks they're supposed to, they're not speaking in the target language. And so I've developed some guidelines that might be helpful to you when you are planning this kind of pair and small group work with authentic resources. So it's centered around four ideas. Make sure you have these four um, components when you're thinking about designing a pair or small group work task. So there should be a task, there should be supports, there should be a process, and there should be a product. So when we talk about tasks, we wanna make sure that the task is achievable in the time that's been given to the students. We want them to have some sort of concrete task that they understand completely and they understand what their accountability is. Under supports, the student gives the directions and models or gives an example before they're sent off to the, so we don't wanna just give the directions in the target language and say, everyone understand? Because kids will tell you they understood even if they did it, right? And so we wanna make sure that they understand by seeing a model or example. And then what support am I giving them during this? Are they using a list of expressions? Do they have a graphic organizer or some other tool to support them through the process to help them persevere in the target language? And then finally, reminding students that I'm available as the teacher in the main meeting room. So if you need me, I'm here and I'm happy to help you out if you get stuck. Then I go to process. What routine are students using while they're doing this? Are they using one of those cooperative learning strategies I just shared? Are they using a reading strategy, a discussion strategy? There needs to be a process. What we don't want to do to students is say, take this authentic resource and talk about it. Students don't know what that means. There needs to be some sort of structure. And then for your product, are they completing an organizer? Are they contributing to a collaborative document or presentation like a Google Slides? Are they contributing to a virtual bulletin board like a Padlet? Are they responsible for reporting out to the large group? So we wanna make sure there's some sort of accountability afterwards, otherwise students don't see why they have to do the task. Now I'm gonna ask you to take another pause and I'd like for you to explore some cooperative learning strategies that are new to you that you can use as the process for pair and small group work. So if you go into my website and you find the page called flexible grouping, scroll down till you see this, this part and you might wanna take a um, screenshot of this right now. And so it says specific cooperative learning strategies. I think there's something like 20 to 25 of these there. So if you already know what inside outside circles are, don't click on that one. The idea is you wanna gain some new strategies that you can um, implement when students are doing their parent small group work. So what I'd like for you to do at this point is pause the video and I'd like you to explore so that you can gain some new cooperative learning strategies to add to your toolbox for when you ask students to do pair and small group work. Great. So we just um, have a break slide in here so that if you need to pause the video and go do a quick break for yourself, grab something to drink or walk around the house a little bit, I welcome you to come back when you're ready. Okay, 
So we've slowly worked our way from the introductory phase to the guided phase, and now we're in the independent phase. So what types of things do students do during the independent phase? Well, I might take something that students have interpreted, a piece of authentic text, and now I'm gonna have it springboard into an interpersonal or presentational activity. Now, this is an important concept. We don't want students just to go into, um, let's say pair or small group work, or interpret a, an authentic resource by themselves, report out about it, and then kind of put that away and say, okay, what's the next activity? But instead, now what am I doing what I learned? What am I doing with what I learned from that interpretive activity? How am I talking to someone else about it? How am I creating a presentational speaking or writing product out of that? And so the idea is we wanna show that these things are connected and not just separate episodes. Um, this could be adding an interpretive component to a performance task. If I'm having like a formative or summative performance task, I could do tasks at varying levels of challenge so that I'm giving a variety of challenge levels. So my advanced learners or heritage speakers have a task that's not too easy for them. I might have them use an authentic resource as the context for a discussion or to do a cultural comparison. I might have them use authentic resources just to enrich and extend their learning, so go beyond. So let's say we've been talking about food, I might do an extension um, activity during the independent phase where they, in, they investigate things like veganism or vegetarianism or meatless Mondays, which are kind of spin-offs from the food unit. Or I may just provide them some independent reading opportunities. So I might have some selected stories online or articles online and they get to just read them for pleasure and not because they're gonna be asked lots of comprehension questions and things about it. And as I shared earlier, it's really important that students see the connection between now that I've interpreted this resource, so what? So now take what you learned from it and do something with it. And that shows the whole concept of the integration of modes and that's important if we use integrated performance assessment with students, because we show them that what I learned from a text, I can now use to talk to somebody else or to create a product for a wider audience. So here's an example of an interpersonal activity. Many of us have done information gap activities before. Some people call these an A-B activity. So the whole concept is person A has information that person B does not have and vice versa, person B has information person A doesn't have. And so we need to talk to each other to find out what we're missing on our infographics. So you see here, all I did is I found a um, infographic that's about human food that you can also give your dog. Okay, so this is during a food unit and it's a great spinoff if you had done family before and talked about pets. And so the whole idea is it's divided by food types. Notice how I covered up two parts of the, info, um, the infographic on the left, just using like a text box. And then on the right-hand side, I used the exact same infographic and I just covered up two different sections. And so we need to ask each other about, so person A is asking person B, well, what vegetables can they eat? And so they're drawing them in or writing them in. And then person B, says the person A, well, what, what meats can they eat? And so the idea is they're using their food words, but they're talking about it in the context of what foods you can have uh, give your dog. Here's another example of an information gap activity. And this has to do with healthy eating. It's a um, infographic in Arabic. And again, you'll see I did the same thing where I just covered up various sections and the students are um, finding out from each other what they're missing. Notice that because this one was imbalanced and there were five, I just didn't use number two. So at, all of them have number two on their um, boards, but they're just missing two other ones, just to make it fair that they have equal amounts of um, information missing. When you look at some authentic texts, some of them just naturally scream out at you as, I would make a great infogap info activity. So look at the one on the left. It has backpacks from back in the day, backpacks now. Think about how one person can, can become the expert of what it was like before 
and the other, what it's like now, and then they ask each other questions about the differences. In the center there is a, um, an infographic in German that talks about the differences of what students give their mothers for Mother's Day versus what they give their fathers for Father's Day. Again, when I look at that infographic, naturally I think, oh, I can cut that down the middle and that could be a jigsaw activity, that could be an info gap activity. And then the one on the right is in French and it's about the differences and how much it costs to have a cat versus a dog. Again, great one that I can cut apart and use as information gap or also as a jigsaw. Another way I can use authentic resources would be to create learning centers. And this happens to be a set of centers that one of my level one middle school teachers created. And this was around the unit of personal description where students were learning SER, the to be verb, and also um, adjectives to describe themselves and others. And so you see here for the speaking center, she used two infographics, one about the Big Bang Theory and one about Monsters, Inc. The students choose a character and then the other students have to ask questions to find out which character they are. So obviously, are you tall? Are you blue? Right, things like that. On the right-hand side there, you'll see there's a listening center where it's a um, song. And on the, on, you'll see on the right there, there's a close activity. So remember, closed activities are where I take lyrics and I take some out and students listen to fill in the ones that are missing. So that's the listening activity. On the bottom left is the reading center. So although that's a commercial, the teacher used the text of the commercial and you're not gonna be able to see this, but on the left, it has uh, forms of the verb be. And then on the right, examples of some of the endings of those sentences from the commercial. And they're just marking them to, match them and then they listen to the commercial. And then for the writing center, the teacher chose two memes or quote type things. They look almost like poems, like the one on the left does, that has lots of examples of how to describe yourself and using adjectives that match their nouns. And the students read these two and then create one that looks like one of those on their own. And so thinking about how I could even base things like learning centers, which by the way, now in virtual learning are separate breakout rooms. So breakout room one is speaking practice, breakout number two is listening practice, and then students rotate over time. I can also use authentic text as a basis for students doing discussion, right? And when I think about students doing discussion, obviously I want it in the target language. So I want to give them the things they need to stay in the target language, like sentence starters and sentence frames and expression lists. Yes, novices can discuss, but it just needs to be highly scaffolded for them. So lots of supports and scaffolds. And what kind of discussion routines or protocols am I going to give them? Again, go back to that idea of what's the routine I'm going to give them to use while they're, or the process they're using while they're participating in the discussion. So here's an example of a quote by Pablo Neruda, where he talks about that people slowly die if they don't do things like travel and read and listen to music. So the idea is that to enjoy the things of life. And so I take this um, quote and I attach to it a discussion strategy. In this case, it's called bounce. Now bounce is where you bounce off what the other person just said. So you see there, there's some sentence frames there that I would have in the target language. So one person starts and says, well, I think it's important to travel because of this and that. And then the next student uses one of these beginnings. Well, that reminds me of how I, it was important to me that I traveled or how much I miss travel since we've been in the pandemic. Or they can start with, I agree because, true, but another example is when, or that's a great point. So it teaches them how to do that filling in so that they're not just saying their opinion, saying their opinion, but connecting the discussion together. And then I can also use authentic text for independent asynchronous work. So imagine you create like a playlist or a choice board for students where they have choices of activities to do on their own outside of class to pra continue practicing using the content and structures. So here's an example of a small choice board in French 
that has to do with winter. And so on the top left, there's some Instagram posts and they're asked to read them and capture what each person said they liked best about winter. On the top right is an infographic about what you should wear in the winter. And students are asked to take notes on the infographic and then record a Flipgrid video on giving advice on what people should wear when it's cold. Bottom left, use words in the word cloud to write descriptive sentences or paragraphs depending on their um, proficiency level. And that's just being able to think about all the words that relate to winter. And then in the bottom right, watch a video and complete the close activity. Remember that's where they fill in the lyrics that are missing. And that one happens to be all about winter. So think about as you're collecting your authentic resources around a topic, you might set some aside for asynchronous time. So I'm gonna save these for things students are doing on their own. And it's a choice board where they're being able to select the ones they want to do that they feel most comfortable with. Now, what's important is that all of these are aimed at the exact same learning targets where we've been talking about winter and what's great about winter and what we should wear in the winter and how cold impacts people and things like that. So it's all in the same context, but I'm giving them a variety of text to interact with. So if you're interested in checking out some more strategies for the modes, so remember in the inter, inter, uh, independent phase, we're talking about interpersonal and presentational. If you go to my website, and again, you might wanna capture this with a screenshot, um, take a photo, go to the page called communicative modes, scroll down till you see this section called skills focused activities and check out some new, um, strategies for the different modes. So if you want students doing interpersonal, you'll see their information gap, but there's several others there you could check out if um, you're looking for strategies that are new to you. Also, if you go on my website and you check out the page called questioning and discussion, scroll down till you see this chart and it's a chart full of discussion strategies or discussion routines and you see their bounce cards are at the bottom. And so there's talking chips, fishbowl, discussion web, say something, et cetera. Add more discussion strategies to your um, toolbox by checking some of those out. So here's another time we're gonna stop and pause. And I've given you three URLs here on the slide. And the concept for this pause is for you to find new cooperative learning strategies for your toolbox that you can use for parent small group work, new discussion strategies for your toolbox to use for student discussion, or student um, strategies for the modes to do interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational. So you can make the decision right now on which of these three you'd like to explore, but now I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and do a little bit of exploration on your own. Your goal is to come up with some new strategies that you never knew before that you can now add to your repertoire as you're implementing authentic resources. Okay, so we're going to stop and reflect for a second because that's been the whole first part of our workshop together. It's all about how I can think through ways I'm using my authentic resources in the various phases of the lesson. And so the question I want you to stop and think about is how might the ideas in this first section enhance your current practices? So think about what we've talked about through this whole first half. So I'll pause for a second just for you to do a quick reflection. Okay, great. So now we're gonna get to that uh, section where we're gonna talk about a thinking frame that you can use for when you're thinking about putting authentic resources into your lesson plans. So let's start with two different mindsets. 
So one mindset about using authentic resources in your lesson plans would be, do you wanna think about your lesson plans as things you already have um, organized? but now you wanna sprinkle some authentic resources in here and there. So you wanna add a couple lesson hooks in, you might wanna put that in as a guided activity here and there. You might wanna use an authentic text for students to interact in a group setting. So how might you use these authentic resources? So one idea is to take lessons that are already set and then alter some of the activities and tasks to now be based on authentic resources. So that's one way to look at it. The second mindset is to think about authentic resources as the main ingredients to your lesson plans. So that means you would start with your authentic resources. So begin with all the resources you have for a particular unit and now build your lessons around those authentic resources. There is no right or wrong. You have the choice of which way you wanna see this, but the idea is you wanna know what approach you're taking. So are the lessons already done and you're inserting them? Or are you starting out with a blank slate? You've got all the authentic resources in front of you and now you're figuring out how they work for you. So what this graphic is, and you will see this in your Google Drive folder, this is a game board I designed. And so if we were in the physical professional learning together, this would be a big laminated game board on the tabletop. But now we're gonna look at it virtually. And so the way I design this game board is all about helping you have a thinking frame for how you might think through how I'm using the various authentic resources I've collected to work for me and my lesson plans. So let's do a little bit of exploration on the graphic first. So look at the boxes all the way around the outside. What I tried to do there is think of every task type that we would typically use with students in our lesson plans. So lesson hooks, modeling, um, interpersonal, reading activities, student discussions, speaking activities, group activities, et cetera. So think about them as all the different types of tasks and activities you would plan for students in your lessons. Now, imagine that I've taken all of the um, authentic resources that I've gathered for a particular unit and I've created a deck of cards with them. So imagine I have a deck of cards in my hand. And so what you're thinking about is, as I'm looking through these authentic resources on the topic of family, I'm gonna now lay them out on this game board to think about, well, which of these would I like to save for a lesson hook? So I'm gonna lay them on top of that top square. Which of these would make a great listening activity? Putting that there. Which of these would be a great group work activity? And so think about dealing out. So think about dealing out like a stack of cards where you think all of these would work well for you. And so that's the concept here is we wanna think about what are the best use? And remember, look at them through various lenses. Is this a good thing for vocabulary? Is this good to reinforce or teach grammar? Is this a good thing for students to discuss in groups? Is this a good resource to cut up and have a jigsaw activity around? So think about it through all the different lenses of the task types. Now in the center of the board, you're going to see some colored boxes and an arrow and things like that. So on the far left, imagine that there's a stack of blue cards there that are all the cooperative learning strategies for productive group work. So those are the ones we talked about earlier. On the far right, you see the rectangle that's a that's pink. Those are all the discussion strategies that I showed you. And so imagine a stack of pink cards there. The yellow arrow is talking about discovery protocols for grammar and context. So that's like pace, right? So what are the different processes I can use to do grammar and context with students? Imagine a little stack of yellow cards there. And then down here in the bottom of the center, you'll see where it says add a graphic organizer. And then above that, add an expression list. That question is what types of graphic organizers or expression lists might I add to the task? And so the idea is that this is a frame for you to think through how you're using your authentic resources in your lesson plans. The second tool I'm gonna give you for thinking this through is what I call the formula. And so I want you to think about the formula in three parts. 
So it's not so different from the four things I told you you should think about for pairs and small group work, right? But there's a three-part formula here. So first I wanna take the authentic resource, then I wanna marry it with some sort of instructional strategy, and then I wanna think about what scaffold or support am I giving students to do the task. So when I think about the formula, what strategies am I thinking about? And again, it could be a reading strategy, a discussion strategy, cooperative learning strategy, interpersonal strategy, presentational strategy, some sort of routine or process. And when I'm thinking about scaffolds and supports, is that a graphic organizer? Is that an expression list? So during the activity, if I'm expecting them to express their opinions, do I give them a little list in the target language of sentence frames that start out, in my opinion, I agree, I disagree. So giving them the phrasing they need to be able to persevere in the target language. So when I talk about the strategies, I'm talking about reading strategies like main idea, key details, reading for context, um, context clues. In the center, different discussion strategies, will be, which we talked about earlier. And on the far right, cooperative learning strategies. And again, that's why I had you explore these earlier because these are the things that'll work for you in the formula. So let's do a couple examples to show you how this might look. So let's imagine in a Chinese class, I show this picture of two little girls getting ready to go to school. So remember, text is anything I can listen to, view or read, so a picture is viewing. And the instructional strategy I'm gonna use is who, what, when, where, why, how. So this happens to be a um, graphic organizer in Chinese that has the different question words on it. So who's in the picture? Where are they? Where are they? When is this happening? And then the scaffold I'm giving them is what I call a picture description frame. And this is a frame that goes over top of the picture and all around the outside, it has examples of ways you might describe the picture. So that's gonna support students through trying to complete the organizer. Here's an example of small group work. So let's say I gave students an article called Let's Celebrate the World Day of Recycling. And I'm gonna have them use a strategy called Discussion Stoplight. And the scaffold or support I'm gonna give them is similar to the Chinese one where it has who, what, when, where, why. So while students read the article by themselves, they fill out the organizer and then they have a discussion using the strategy called discussion stoplight. And there's three cards that go with that. And again, in the, the virtual format that can be done virtually where you either get the card repeat, new idea or add on. And so you repeat what your, per what your partner just said, you add, you add a brand new idea or you add on to their idea. And again, it's just a way to think about how to have a discussion in the target language. Here's an example for an interpersonal activity. I have students looking at three different infographics that are about the benefits of listening to music. And notice that they're just three different ones, but they're all about why you should listen to music and why it's good for your health. Now the strategy I'm gonna use is inside outside circles. So on the left there, you see there's like a little organizer there. And so they filled in the information about their um, infographic but as they go around the inside outside circles, which you can do in a socially distanced way, um, nowadays in the socially distanced face-to-face -face classroom, and they're finding out what benefits their friends got from their other infographics. And then they're going to get to use a, an expressions uh, placemat that has a variety of phrasing on it that will help them continue the conversation, the interpersonal exchange in the target language. Here's an example of a guided or modeling activity. So this would be for the guided phase. So here's a um, uh, video in Arabic about a family. And I'm gonna use the think aloud strategy with them. And they're gonna fill in the organizer with me. So I'm gonna guide them through. So I'll show a certain amount of the video, I'll stop and I'll think out loud. And then together we'll fill in the parts of the um, organizer that we can. 
and then start the video back up, stop, think out loud. Again, this is all giving students thinking frames or ideas about how they would interpret it by themselves. Here's an example for pair work. So I've got some Instagram posts about social distancing. They're going to use the strategy think, pair, share. And the scaffold and support they're going to use is what are the pros of social distancing? What are the cons? So during the think phase, they're just look at reading the um, Instagram posts and filling out the pros and cons. Then they're going to pair with their partner and talk about the pros and cons they got from the text. And then we're going to put two pairs together and they're going to share across what they learned. So that's that whole share just with a partner and then share with a larger group. And don't forget, after that, we want students to now take that and do something with it. So are they creating an infographic that combines all those ideas into the why um, social distancing is, has pluses and minuses? Here's an example for a student discussion. Here's a um, music video in French with the lyrics that have missing words. The instructional strategy is nomination cards. And the scaffold and support, I want them to summarize what they think they heard. Nomination cards is a is kind of like, I liken it to UNO in the sense that there's cards that say, the person on your right goes next, skip the next person, you know, things like that. And again, it's just showing ways to keep the conversation going. So if you're interested in digging more into scaffolds and supports, because remember in my formula, that's the third piece. So we've done a lot with authentic resources. We've done a lot with instructional strategies, but if you wanna dig in more about scaffolds and supports, you can go to my website on the page called scaffolds and supports. There you're gonna find links to the virtual word walls I've, I've created for multiple languages that have those expression lists that have like opinion phrases, describing a picture phrases, things like that. And it also has lots of links to graphic organizers. Or you can go onto my Pinterest boards and that one's called Target Language Tools, Supports and Scaffolds. And there you're going to find lots of expression lists that you can have students use as a scaffold or support. So again, if you wanna take a screenshot or a picture of this, um, this slide, I'm inviting you to pause the video at this point and just take a look at some of the scaffolds and supports I've collected that you might want to use for your formula. So I'll pause here. Okay, so if you go into your Google Drive folder that I shared earlier, there are some scenarios there. And these are just examples of ways teachers use authentic resources for various purposes in their lesson plans. And so what I invite you to do at this point is again, pause the video, go into the Google Drive folder, and I want you to take a look at some of the scenarios and think about how the formula is being used by that teacher. So you're looking for the authentic resource, you're looking for the instructional strategy they're using, and you're looking for what scaffolds and supports they're giving. And so just by looking at this one here, you already see that there's some sentence frames in that second section there. So blank percent think, I agree in my opinion. So there's examples of a scaffold and support. So a lot of folks love seeing these kinds of examples because it further illustrates how to use the formula in real live lessons. So I invite you now again to pause your video and go into the Google Drive folder and just explore some of the scenarios I put there to further um, deepen your understanding of how the formula might work. Okay, in the end, 
what I hope you're walking away with today is some sort of framing for how do I make authentic resources work for me in my lesson plans. So one is, is to think about it in terms of the formula. If I find a great authentic resource, what am I having students do with it and what help do they get or support do they get? So let's imagine you're using just a meme as a lesson hook. The instructional strategy might be turn and talk where they're just turning and talking to their friend. And the scaffold or support they might use might be an expression list or might just be the vocabulary list. So you don't have to make this super complicated. It can be very simple. A meme is a lesson hook. The instructional strategy is journaling where they're gonna write a journal entry and the scaffold of support might be a list of transition words that you want them to use in their journaling. So again, you don't have to make this super difficult, but the idea is we want them to make an impact. There's a reason why we wanna use authentic resources. And remember our whole goal is for students to continue to grow in their proficiency. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope you got lots of ideas and resources from our time together.